So for the domain and range of this relation, if we start with the x values, so the domain, there is an open circle here and here, meaning we're not including two or eight, but everything up to those points. Here we have a closed circle, meaning we are including negative five. So we get every x value as we travel from negative five up to but not including two. There's a break in the graph. So for the domain, I'll write this as we're going from negative five up to two, but we don't include that because there's an open circle there. But we do include everything on the other side of two up until we get to eight. So I'll put a union and write two to eight. This is the domain of this relation. Now the range is going to be Let's see, the lowest point on the graph appears here, and that is at y is equal to 2. Now we don't include 2, but as the graph moves up, we get, you know, we get a lot of repeated stuff over here, but we get everything that goes from this y value up to this y value of 8. That's everything from 2, not including 2, up to and not including 8. So I have the domain and the range. Now, is this thing a function? And the answer is yes. Every single point that you choose on this graph, there's never a second one above it or below it. Now, if for some reason there happened to be a point, let's say like right here, okay, we would have something that is not a function, but that did not happen. So the answer to this is yes, it is a function. I want to solve the inequality negative 3x plus 1 is greater than x minus 7. And we're going to do that by using the graph that I'm giving us here. The first step is to figure out where these two things are equal. So where is negative 3x plus 1 equal to x minus 7? That's a very easy equation to solve. I'm going to subtract x from both sides and also subtract 1. Uh, let's see, we get negative 3 4 x is equal to negative 8. If I divide both sides by negative 4, I get that x is equal to positive 2. And this is not a surprise because I can actually see that in my picture. That's right here at x is equal to 2. So that's perfect. That matches up. But now I have to figure out from the graph, where is negative 3x plus 1 greater than x minus 7? Now I will note that the blue graph is referring to the negative 3x plus 1. And the reason is it has a y-intercept of 1, and the slope is definitely negative 3. You go down 1 and over 3. So here's my blue graph of, I'll just label it here, negative 3x plus 1. It's got to be that the other graph is x minus 7, and it is. So the y-intercept is negative 7. The slope is clearly 1, right? You go over 1 and up 1. So this is x minus 7. That matches up. So where is negative 3x plus 1 strictly greater than x minus 7? Where is this graph above this graph? Clearly, it's this portion over here. So I'm going to label that. This is where negative 3x plus 1 is greater than x minus 7. Our job is to decide, well, which x values are we talking about? The x values are all the ones to the left of 2. So the answer is x is less than 2. You could use an interval, negative infinity to 2, if you would like, but that is the answer to this question. So for this problem, we are decreasing the concentration of acid by pouring in a 5% acid solution, so that's what x is going to represent. It's going to be the liters of the 5% acid solution. So my equation is going to be, again, what I'm mixing together set equal to what I want to end up with. What I'm mixing together is we have 5 liters of a 20% acid solution. So 0.2 times 5 is the amount of acid in that solution. And we're pouring into this some number of liters of a 5% acid solution. So here's one side of my equation. I have two terms because I'm mixing two things together. Again, it's always a percent times an amount. What I want to end up with is something that is 18% acid. So that's going to be 0.18 
the percent times the amount of stuff that we have. The amount that we have is five liters from the first solution plus however much we pour in from the second. I have my equation. The goal is now to solve for x. I'm going to do it by distributing this 0.18 and combining some like terms. So 0.2 times five is one. I have to leave this as 0.05x. Okay, if I multiply in the 0.18, I get 0.9 plus 0.18x. I'm going to subtract 0.9 from both sides and also subtract 0.5x. And what I end up with is 0.1 is equal to 0.13x. If I divide both sides by 0.13, uh, I can just do that right in my calculator. Um, 10 divided by 13. Yeah, type that out here. Okay, I get approximately around to two decimal places because the decimal goes on forever. Like this will give me a good approximate value. If I go to two places of so 0.77 is equal to X. So I wasn't expecting it to be a, you know, large number of liters here, but um, 0.77 liters of the 5% acid solution will decrease it from 20% down to 18%. To sketch these two transformations uh, based off of the original graph here, uh, they both have two different changes, and I think they can both fit in this uh, window as well. Starting with y equals negative 2x, sorry, uh, negative 2 times f of x plus 5. It's technically uh, three steps, you know, three things are happening here. But I would first work within the parentheses, and I see this plus 5. This actually means go left five places. Here I have a 2, which doubles the y value, but the negative reflects the y value. In one step, you could just multiply the y values by negative 2. That's going to be the note I leave to myself. I'm going to multiply the y's by negative 2, noting that it'll first double it and then reflect it. All right, so what I'll do is look at these three points, run them through those two steps, and see what we end up with. I'll start with this point here. If I go left 5 places, I go from negative 4 to negative 9. The y value is currently 0, and if I multiply that by negative 2, it stays 0. This is my first point. All right, I'll do that for this point here as well. If I go left 5 places, I end up at negative 3. Now the y value is 6. If I double it, it goes to 12. If I make it negative, it becomes negative 12. So that's right here. That's negative 3, negative 12. And the last point would be this one. If we go left 5 places, the y value is currently 4. If I double it, it gives me 8. And if I make it negative, it becomes negative 8. So that is negative 1, negative 8. And this is my graph. And that makes sense. The whole thing moved left five places, flipped upside down, and then stretched. For my second equation, let's see. We have 0.5x plus 4. This really is just two steps. The 0.5x you think would take half of the x values, but it doesn't. In fact, we're going to first double. We're going to do the opposite. We're going to double the x's. And then the plus 4 simply means go up four places. I'll again start with this point and run through this process. All right, the x value is negative 4. If I double it, it goes to negative 8. And if I go up 4 places, I end up here. Negative 8, positive 4. All right, let's uh, figure out what happens to this point here. The x value is 2. If I double it, it goes out to 4. If I go up four places, I go up to 10. So I'm at 4, 10. 
And the last spot here is, okay, we're at x is equal to 4. If I double it, it goes out to 8. And if I go up four places, I go up to 8. So I'm at 8, comma 8. My graph looks like this. It's definitely doubled in the x direction and then up four places, and that's my final answer. Okay, solving another absolute value inequality. Where is first figuring out where uh, these two are equal? I'm going to solve where is x plus 3 equal to 2x plus 5, as well as where is x plus 3 equal to negative 2x plus 5. Again, just being careful to say when I make the one side negative, that negative gets distributed to both terms. Starting with my equation on the left, I guess I'll subtract x from both sides and also subtract 5. And I get negative 2 is equal to x, so one of my solutions is very simple. If I distribute that negative on this equation, okay, I get x plus 3 is equal to negative 2x minus 5. I'll add 2x to both sides and also subtract 3. And I get 3x is equal to negative 8. Uh, so this won't line up on an integer, but that's okay. I get x is equal to negative 8 thirds. The rest is happening in my graphing calculator, where in place of y1, I'll put the absolute value of x plus 3. In place of y2, I'll put the absolute value of 2x plus 5. I'll sketch what I see, but I want to know where like the blue graph I sketch will be greater than the green one. So I had to adjust my window a little bit because it was kind of hard to see what was happening, but I did in fact check my solutions and let's see, I had both negative 2 and negative 8 thirds. So those are both correct. I'll try to you know label that here. This one was negative 2. This was negative 8 thirds, a little bit past negative 2. Okay, so I'm now left deciding where is the blue graph above the green graph. And there's only two options. It's either got to be between these two values or on the outside of those two values. So could it be on the outside? If I check outside of these two values, I first get to the blue graph and then the green one. That's not good. I want the opposite, right? I don't want this to be greater than this. So here, the blue graph is lower than the green one. And the same thing happens over here. I first get to the blue graph, then the green one, so no good. Um, it's got to be that we're between the two values, but just to double check it, if I'm between these two values, the blue graph is larger than the green one with respect to the y values. So that's my solution. I'm actually between negative 8 thirds and negative 2. So you could write your answer simply as negative 8 thirds is less than x is less than negative 2. Nothing wrong with that. Uh, or you could use an interval if you would like, negative 8 thirds to negative 2. Uh, there's no equal sign, so I'm not including either of those endpoints, but uh, this is the solution. You could write it as either one of those. So again, we're solving this inequality, where is x squared minus 6x plus 8 strictly greater than 0? So the goal is to figure out where is it equal to 0. We'll plot those points, and then I'll actually sketch the graph of the equation on here and determine where is it above y is equal to 0. So first starting by solving this thing equal to 0 by either factoring or using the quadratic formula. Um, I think uh, this one should factor just fine. You could break it up into two pieces, see where it's equal to 0. I'd have to have an x and an x. It's got to be that both are negative, right? Because the last number is positive. A negative times a negative gives me a positive. Yet, it would have to add to a negative number. So two numbers that multiply to a positive 8, yet add to a negative 6, would have to be negative 2 and negative 4. The product is positive 8. The sum is negative 6. And this means my solutions are x is equal to 2, but also x is equal to 4. So when I graph this, I should see something crossing the axis here and here. So I'll put this in my calculator. Let's see what we get. All right, yeah, so this one fits in the window relatively nicely anyway. Drops down like this. Again, it doesn't have to be perfect. All we have to identify is 
where's the graph above zero? And that's really easy to see. Again, two options. It's either between these two values or is on the outside of those two values. Clearly, if we want above zero, we are talking about this portion of the graph and this portion of the graph. The corresponding x values are greater than 4 and also less than 2. So the solution you can write just like that. x is less than 2 or x is greater than 4. In interval notation, that would be negative infinity to 2, union, 4 to positive infinity, and that's it. All right, another question involving domain. This is very similar to the one in the previous uh, practice, but you know, just to write this out, the domain of f of x is going to be all real numbers. So you could write that, or you know, just all real numbers. There's no square roots or fractions. Whereas in g of x, there's precisely one number that you can't use. Clearly, that number is negative 8. If you put negative 8 in place of this x, you would have a 0 in the denominator all by itself. You can't put that in your calculator. It would give you an error message because you can't divide by 0. OK, how do those values play a role in the compositions of these functions? Let's start by getting a formula for f of g of x. Again, what this means is I go to the function f, and wherever I see x, I replace it with 1 divided by x plus 8. That simply means here I place this. This is my equation, 2 minus 1 over x plus 8. You could try to simplify this, maybe may write it as one fraction. I suggest leaving it just as this. For g of f of x, we are doing the opposite, right? What we're going to do is now, in the function g, put f of x in its place. That just means right here, instead of x, I'll replace it with 2 minus x. So my formula is 1 over 2 minus x plus 8. You could put some parentheses around it if you'd like. It really doesn't matter. Um, this one, again, is worth simplifying because I have a 2 and an 8, which are being added together. So technically, simplified, this is going to be 10 minus x. So I have both f of g of x and g of f of x, noting that they are different functions. So what's the domain for both of these compositions? What's the domain of f of g of x? So uh, that one's simple. I can just look at this and say, clearly, you can't put negative 8 in place of x. If you did, it couldn't even go into the function g. I can see that right here. It would cause an issue. So x cannot be equal to negative 8. That is no good. Whereas if you look at g of f of x, even if I look at the formula, I mean, yeah, clearly negative 8's okay. You'd have 1 divided by 18. That's fine. But the number that causes an issue in this one is 10. If you put 10 in place of x, you would definitely divide by 0. So I'm going to throw away the value 10 and just note that every other number is okay.